Welcome, church. We thank the Lord for bringing us here today on another Sabbath day to worship Him. And to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We thank the Lord for the mountain experience of Sister Yoli and um, or the, or other members in Haiti and Sister Ivan. Sister Ivan had a mountain experience. Hallelujah. I don't know the mountain that Sister Yuli climbed, but I know that mountain that Sister Ivan climbed. It's a mountain with bottomless valleys. And they both had a wonderful experience. We're reminded in scripture by the Lord that the mountains, the munitions of rocks shall be our refuge. So go look for your mountains in Florida. You may, but I don't think you're going to find any here. We thank God for his uh, guiding hand and to help us to reach out, to help us to learn that there are others out there that need the crumbs that fall from our table. Amen. The crumbs that fall from our table, they need it. And I'm telling you to offer them any crumbs. No. I'm trying to give you a perspective of how desperate the situation is out there for some people. As we go into the word of the Lord this morning, let us pray. Our eternal Father and our God, we thank you once more for the opportunity to come and bow down before you to worship God, our Creator. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to call upon your name. We pray that you will give us a heart of humility, a heart of searching, a heart of desire in this mysterious time in which we live. Time when strange things are happening. Times when prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes, whether we recognize them or not. Time which is signaling that eternal morning for some where there will be no night and a time of eternal darkness for some who will see no day. We pray, Lord, that you will help us today. Take one more step in making our calling and our election sure of planting our feet firmly on Jesus Christ, the solid rock, in obedience to his command, not in presumption to do as we desire or we feel, but to submit ourselves to the commandments of God, that you may be well pleased with us. Bless us now as we study your word. We ask it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and for his righteous sake. Amen. 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 The book of Zechariah, chapter 10, and verse 1, our scripture reading. We are going to be turning the pages of the word this morning. Last week, the preacher admonished us that here a little, there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. And those of us who do not fortify our minds with line upon line and precept upon precept, and the preacher demonstrated this on the word of God, will not have uh, the strength of mind that will be required to stand against the terrible days which are before us. Are you hearing me? The study of the word caused changes in our mind, physiological and anatomical changes. When we use certain neurons in our minds, those pathways grow. It's the same thing that happens to drug addicts. As they are stimulated by the drugs, those neuronal pathways grow and get stronger and it makes it more and more difficult, nearly impossible for them to give up. When we study the word of God, the same things happen. Changes, 
physical changes happens in our brains. That is why after you memorize the text over and over again, after a while it becomes a second nature. You just open your mouth and it flows up. The word of God says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against. Our scripture reading Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. The word of the Lord says, Ask you of the Lord, reign in the time of the latter rain. In the time of when, Virgin? In the time of the latter rain. Ask for it. Don't presume that it's going to fall on everybody. Ask for it. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to how many? Everyone. Everyone that? Everyone grass in the field. What is grass, brethren? What is grass? Do you know what is grass in scripture? Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 24. Where are we going? We are going to 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we are going to the 24th verse. Philemon, Hebrews, James, Peter, John. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, what does it say? For all flesh is as grass. For all flesh is as grass. And the glory of man as the flowers of grass. What happens to the grass? The grass wither it. And the flower faded. Isn't that us? Let me give you another one. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 6. Where are we going? Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 6. I don't want you to take it because I say so. I want you to see that it's written there for our learning in scripture. What does it say? The voice said cry. And he said what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodness of thereof is as a flower of the field the grass withereth the flower fadeth because the spirit of the lord blow it upon it surely the people is grass so ask of the lord rain in the time of the latter rain so the lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone us grass in the field how many people are crying out to God for the latter rain today? They're looking for some fancy day, some excitement, some emotional high. When 5,000 people will be converted in one day, just like in the day of Pentecost. I want to tell you that's going on in Nigeria a long time ago. Ten years ago, one brother was praying in Nigeria. Lord, look how many people are here that do not know the word. And when he preached and he baptized 10,000, he went on his knees and he cried. He said, Lord, not nearly enough. And he went back and he preached the word again. This time he baptized 20,000. And he said, no, Lord, this cannot be. Only 20,000? He went back and he had another effort. This time he baptized 40,000. Still wasn't satisfied. Millions are going down in Christless graves. Why are we counting them in a few thousands that are accepting the Lord? When he had his, not, his next effort, he baptized 80,000 people. Glory to God. Amen. We don't want to bring forth tenfold or fifteenfold. We want a hundredfold for our God. Amen. The people are there. I see them every day. Going to Christless graves. The word of the Lord says, We should ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Yes. What is rain? Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 2. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Deuteronomy. We are going to the 32nd division. And we are going to read verse 2. What is rain, brethren? The 
word of the Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 2, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. Notice the language of how the doctrine will come. It won't float. It won't grow. It won't sing. It will drop. So like anything we just read in Isaiah, Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1, it sounds like rain. My doctrine will drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. The latter rain is one. I know it because I've experienced it myself. God has his servants out there preaching the truth, doctrine from the word of God. And people have been knocking, they have been calling. How come I don't hear this at my church? How come nobody's telling me this? Could it be because your preacher is not asking God for the latter rain? And it shall come to pass in Joel chapter 2 and verse 29 that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Some people don't like prophecy today. They scoff at prophecy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God's Spirit is being poured out today and I know it because I see the signs when men are joining with men and mocking God and women are joining women and are teaching our children to go the same with them I know something is going to happen because God is not going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's not. So let men uh, walk in pompousity and in their pride now. For the word of the Lord tells us that one day they will run to the very rocks and caves where they are worshipping Satan today and beg for those rocks to fall upon them. In our Jamaican parlance, we have a saying, first laugh is not the laugh. So let them mock now. The time of the latter rain is here. In the days of God, old God's spirit is working to prepare a people to finish the work. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. I assume that many of you are quite familiar with the account in Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar was king of the worldwide superpower known as Babylon. We are told that in the night he dreamed dreams. <clears throat> we are told that he could not remember. His sleep broke from him. He knew there was something important about this dream, so he called his trusted council, the soothsayers, the magicians, the sorcerers, and he required of them to reveal to him the dream he dreamt. Come on, you're magicians. You can tell what is going to happen tomorrow. Surely you could tell me what my dream was. Um, and then, when they could not reveal to him the dream, he sent forth a death decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be slain. And time, and at that time, there were some faithful servants of God who had studied in the schools of Babylon. And they have become wise men and prominent men in the courts of Babylon. Their names, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, went forth to execute the death decree on these wise men. Daniel asked him, why is this decree so hasty? He said, the king said all the wise men should be slain. Daniel asked time that to be given him that he would be able to be, uh, he would be able to reveal the dream. And this request was granted. And Daniel and his three friends went and they prayed. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31, the word of the Lord says, 
Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Verse 32. This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his thigh of brass, his legs of iron, and the feet of part iron and part clay. Pay close attention. The word says, so saw is still a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet of the iron and clay and break it in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff. Chaff on the summer's threshing floor. If you're following so uh, with me, say amen. amen. The wind carried them away. What happened? The wind carried them away. I'm going somewhere. There was, uh, there was found for them anymore no place. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Uh, verse 36. This is the dream, Daniel said, O king, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Where did Nebuchadnezzar get his power, brethren? God of heaven hath given it to him because the kingdom of Israel was in rebellion against God. Not because we are Seventh-day Adventists. Don't get in a state of pompousness that God has to save me. If he rejected the Jews worshipping right beside us down there, he'll reject us too. He used a pagan nation to rule the world here. So, verse 39, And after these things shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall rule over some of the earth, all the earth. Now I want for you to understand, my brothers and sisters, this prophetic image. And I want you to see what was going on in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. And this kingdom was symbolic. This head of gold was symbolic of a kingdom. Each of these kingdoms were worldwide superpowers. The word says a stone was cut out from the mountain and smote the image on its feet. And it became a mountain. We are going there. And that mountain filled the whole earth. In that process, all the image shattered. We may say today, but where is the rest of the image? I want to guarantee you it is still there. The head of gold is there. The chest and arms of silver is still there. The belly and thigh of brass is there. And the legs of iron is still there. But we are down in the feet of iron and clay. Come with me. Now I want you to look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 with me. Because the Bible gives us a prophetic interpretation of what that great mountain that filled the whole earth is symbolic of. And in the days of those kings, what? In the days of those kings, it didn't say in the day of this king, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. You have a choice today. You can choose the kingdoms of this world or you can invest in that kingdom to come. Some people like to see what is happening. But there, this is a time when we cannot walk by sight. We have to walk by faith. Faith in Christ Jesus and his word. 
I want something clear in your minds. The kingdoms of this world will one day come to an end. And I believe most of us sitting in this room today will live to see that. Because it is so near. Servant of the Lord tells us in great controversy, comes when it may, God's second coming will take the world by an overwhelming surprise. So brother Paul, you can preach until you're blue in the face. You can preach until blood run out of your nose. Comes when it may, this kingdom is going to take the world by an overwhelming surprise. So when I don't listen, I won't get discouraged and listen. I won't get discouraged because there might just be one. There might be one somewhere that is listening. Yes. One somewhere that will say, how oh, come somebody didn't share this with me? Yes. And I want to be a part of this kingdom. And in Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, the kingdoms of this world are swept away. I want you to pay close attention. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles. To Isaiah 57 and verse 30. I don't know if I'm going to get done today, but that's okay. Elder Sinclair will give me another chance, another time to, yes. to finish. Yes. Isaiah 57 and verse 30. The word says, When thou criest, let thy companions deliver thee. But the wind shall carry them away. Vanish shall take them. But he that put at his trust in me shall possess the land. And shall inherit what? My holy mountain. Him that does what, brethren? Him that does what, brethren? Put at his trust in me. God is speaking. Look at the first part of the text. When thou Christ let thy companies deliver thee. It's mocking, doesn't it? Yeah. I am going to put you in a situation. And I'm going to mock you. Why don't your God come deliver you? Do you know anyone who have ever had that experience? Yes. Hmm? Yes. And Daniel's three friends later on were forced to worship the golden image and the king mocked them I want to see which God is going to deliver you out of my hands Virgin is coming again yes. the word of God is sure yes. when thou Christ let thy companions deliver thee mm -hmm. the word says the wind sister Yoli, shall carry them away So you see what's going on here? They are mocking us. Are you see what is going on here? Brothers and sisters, in Revelation chapter 7, there are four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the winds of strife. Do you know why? You think God has nothing to do? You think God is not hurting in his heart to get us into heaven? Jesus said at the communion table with longing have I desired to eat this bread out again with you but I won't be able to until in my father's name. He's waiting. So for 2,000 years Jesus is waiting to have communion with us. You think he doesn't have anything to do? Why he hasn't come yet? And smite the image on its legs yes. and destroy it. But those four angels are all in the wings of strife. Why? We saw another angel ascending from the east, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the trees, till we have seen the servants of God. Where? Yeah. In their foreheads. There's only one. Place, you'll find the seal of God in the scriptures. Amen. That's in the Sabbath command. Amen. The seal of God has his name. Yes. 
its title and its territory, just like any other seal. Donald Trump, title, president, territory, United States of America. Every seal must have those three qualifications. And then the Sabbath command, we see it. For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is. It's the Sabbath command. The Lord God created heaven, earth, the sea, and everything. What's his title? Creator. It's his name, the Lord God. It's his territory, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is the universe. You won't find it any place else. And that seal must be written within our foreheads. The Sabbath is the only of one of the Ten Commandments that people don't like. It's too inconvenient. Saturday is the best day to work. It's the best day to go to the market. All the trucks coming with fresh produce somewhere around Friday because they know everybody's turning up at the market on Friday, Saturday. If you work on Saturday, you won't have any discrimination from your boss. They want people to work on Saturday. And Satan is making it his point of duty that if you dare stick out your neck that you're going to keep Saturday, he's going to chop it off. The road to Emmaus, the road, the walk with Jesus is not going to be easy. Sister Yoli, that walk up the mountain is not going to be easy. Christianity is not going to be easy. The altar of sacrifice, we discussed it on our sanctuary pictorial right here. It's a sacrifice. The sacrifice brethren died. Eggs are not sacrifice. That's an offering. It's your life. Your blood. That's what happened to the sacrifice. Are you with me? So get the offering mentality away. It's going to take you everything to get up to that mountain. You have to break your alabaster box with your one year's worth of spite now. It's going to cost you. So, the, the servants of God must be sealed. God is going to have a people that will inherit his holy mountain. Whether you like it or not, you can choose to be among them or you can stay away. But he will have a people. Go with me to Zechariah chapter uh, 8 and verse 3. Where are we going? Zechariah 8 and verse 3. The word of the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of Truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Yes. Are you getting ready to climb that mountain? To be a part of that mountain? Sister Yoli, the New Jerusalem is not coming to Florida. No, no. So enjoy your walk to the mountain. And tell God, I'm going to do it a second time. Give me strength, Lord. I'm going back up there. Is holy mountain. We are looking at Zechariah 8 and verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, I will return unto Zion. And where I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. So what is the holy mountain that God's people are to inherit? Jerusalem. Even the new Jerusalem. And right now, as we speak, God is preparing a people to receive uh, this transition to the new Jerusalem. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 2, And I saw the holy city, 
the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and I will dwell with them, and they shall be my people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. It's a reality. It's a reality. We are told in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8. It is in these passages that I understand the love of God. I should say I begin to understand the love of God. Verse 4, rather. Revelation 20 and verse 4. The word says, I saw thrones. And they sat upon them. Which they? Which they are we talking about? And judgment was given unto them. Plural language. Who are these? The souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, sister Laura. Huh? And for the word of God. Where were these people sitting? Thrones. Are you afraid to say? Thrones. They were sitting in the throne. Yes. They were not sitting in the audience. They were sitting in his throne. And which have not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor received its mark in, his, in their hands or in their foreheads. And they lived and did what? And reigned with Christ. Are you preparing to live and reign with Christ? Get, get, get it in your heads. We're not going to heaven to walk around and do nothing. God has a work. We are going to sit beside him in his throne. Since I've been reading the Bible, I've never seen one text, one account where the angels are sitting with him in his throne. They minister before him and around him. I don't see any text. If you see it, I'd be glad to accept it. Share it with me. So, as we prepare ourselves to sit with Jesus in his throne, uh, when the new Jerusalem shall descend, we have some who sees us as crazy. This great hope we have, this preparation that some are making, we have a people that are characterized by a scoffing spirit. For in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, uh, There will come a time, it says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own loss. What are they doing? Yeah. Verse 4, saying, where is the promise of his coming? He's been gone 2,000 years. And he can't come back yet. Maybe his chariot got prompted or run out of gas. He can't come back and they laugh. I see them on the internet. They mock me. They mock my messages when I post scripture. They mock him and they mock me. They laugh at Sister Alicia and they mock me. And we are stupid. But I press on. They have a mocking spirit. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued, the sun rise and the sun set, the rivers flow and the rain fall. We mow the land and it grows again. What's new, forest? You babbler just like the rest of them. Where is this change? One little one out of Jamaica. He posted his sign. 
I, am a, I am of that order now. Last week they snuffed out his life. He was heading to make it big in the world of American rap music because he added this Jamaican flair to his rap music, kind of a little 25% of reggae into the rap. And it was a different sound. They wrote of him this week, in spite of his demons, they use the word, he had a freshness to rap. He was heading for the top. But Frederick, I don't know where he's coming from, but most people that are born in the islands hear of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. If you don't go to Seventh Adventist Church, you go to Pentecostal Church, or Church of God, or Jehovah's Witness, but the testimony is planted. We go to school and we have to have worship at school. You come with your sign. I'm not mocking him. It's just a pity that for this temporal greatness, we exchange eternal life with Jesus Christ of Nazareth in heaven, in his throne. A kingdom that shall never pass away. But they laugh and they mock. The TVs mock us. The movies mock the media mock the reality of Jesus. They mock it and they laugh. The Bible speaks of them coming. We are going back to Psalm. We are going back to Psalm chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord knows that they are going to mock us. He doesn't stop them. He doesn't stop them. In the Lord I put my trust. How say ye to my soul? Flee to thy mountain. They're mocking. They're mocking. They're mocking. Look at it. In the Lord I put my trust. Yeah? You put your trust in the Lord. Huh? Oh, say they flee as a bird to your mountain. That mountain, Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. Huh? They're mocking. Are you seeing what they're doing here? Scoffers flee as a bird to your long mountain for lo. The wicked bend their bow. What are they doing, brethren? Verse 2. The wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the strings. Are they what? No, oh, there's a word here. Privily. In clandestine order. In secrecy. They are going to shoot at you. What are they shooting? They are shooting the upright. Huh? They are shooting at the upright in heart. But the Bible tells us here that the wicked are bending their bows. They are making ready. Brothers and sisters, there is a work that the wicked are engaged in right now. A work that they are doing in secrecy. Privately. That word really means in darkness when the sun sets the Bible says they don't like the light because the light will show their deeds both physical deeds and spiritual deeds if they conducted their worship there was a worship in 2015 downtown Washington at the Capitol and they had the man with the goat's head, with breast, so he's a woman, and penis, so he's a man. And they worshipped him, and they cursed Jesus on the plaza of the capital of this country. A place that you and I, by no means or money, could get a chance to hold up a little church service. To never happen. They had their service, and when they were done, they culminated that service with two men, two men rather. Pardon my language. I don't need to say more. <coughs> Worshiping the devil. 
but they did it in the dark of night because their deeds are evil. They're making their, their arrows upon their bow and they're doing their dark deeds in secrecy. And this work, they are preparing a darker work against you and I who call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm telling you this because I don't want it to come as a shock when they walk in and they uncuff some of us or all of us and take us off to jail. Don't be surprised. Come to Peter and Paul. It's going to happen to us. So get your hearts ready. Get your hearts ready to stand strong. Get your heart to recall the scriptures that the Lord planted in your minds. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, even so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. Sister Yoli says she has no legs. How did she get up to 8,000 feet? Huh? I know you, Sister Yvonne, when you look down in those gullies over those St. Chandler Hills. You're a St. Elizabeth lady. You come from flat land. I know that mountain. And I'm from St. Andrew. And when I went to that place, it made me quick. When you look down and you can't see the bottom, all the way down, and your car is driving three inches from it because there is practically no road. Lord said, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, even so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, way back when, even forever. Don't mind what is coming out at you. You're going to see, be not alarmed. Who are the upright? They are bending their bow against the upright what def defines a person who is upright turn with me to psalms chapter 19. we're going to psalms chapter 19 verse 18 keep your fingers there the word of the lord says in psalm chapter 19 verse 13 keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then shall i be upright and i shall be innocent from the great transgression see keep us back from presumptuous sin god hates sin brethren and god the only thing god hates more than sin is presumptuous that talk god will understand after he has given us his command my little children first john chapter uh two my little children sin not most people hasten on to the next um, phrase. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Is God telling us that we can go ahead and sin? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, my little children, do not sin. Do not purposely go and sin. If in your walk with Jesus you stumble into sin, get up. You have an advocate. His blood, his sacrifice is there for you. But God is not a part of presumptuous sin. You all know Catherine. Catherine just turned three. When Catherine was two, Catherine one day went on the table and she took my laptop and she poured water on it and she was wiping it with, with the, the hand towel. And I said, Catherine, what are you doing? She said, I'm cleaning it, Daddy. She was right. He needed some cleaning. But you know what that did to my laptop, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> it, it rendered it useless. And of course, uh, the word says, my little children sin not. Now that phrase there, it's, a, and it's an endearing term. Um, a child is someone that is growing physically, mentally, and spiritually. Yes. Catherine now says, Daddy, are we ready to go to church? Catherine used to say, where are we going, Daddy? And I said, we're going to church. No, let, I mean, let's not go to church. <laughs> and she would cry. She didn't know what she was saying. But the grace that I would e e extend to Catherine, and she was too. I'm not going to extend such grace when she's five. 
So God expects us to grow. And we should grow out of milk into mature food. And that is why we have to be tender to people that don't look like us and don't dress like us. Because we don't know where they are in this growth process. But he says, my little children, sin not. In 1 John chapter 1, we notice the language here is black and white. God says, do not sin. And in verse 5 it says, This then is the message which we have heard from the beginning, and we declare to you that God is light, and in him there is some darkness, right? No darkness. No. No darkness, no darkness at all. Why then do we see in our churches today light mingling with darkness? No, not barring any. Seventh day Adventist churches. Huh? Light mingling with darkness. Pentecostal churches, the same thing. Church of God, the same thing. Where is this new thing coming from that God sits beside Satan and bargain with him? <laughs> Says God is light and there is, in him there is no darkness at all. Amen. Matter of fact, in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Brethren, this is bold talk, straight talk. Don't let anybody tell you it's, it's okay. No. We must grow. But in our world, this is not acceptable. It's not politically correct. Um, we, 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 our church is now want to accept people living in sin. Uh, nobody is calling people out of sin. Uh, the word of the Lord says in first, second Corinthians chapter 6, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. Yes. Don't touch it. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather reprove them. But that reproving must be in love. Amen. It's not in a pharisaical way where I am better than you. Amen. But we must strive to walk in uprightness and purity. That is what this time when Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary demands. That we walk in uprightness. So God is laying out for us that we should walk in uprightness. When the records say, if a man sin, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous, what is he saying? He's saying that Jesus is prepared to stand up and advocate for us if we fall. Yes. Do you walk outside and try to trip up and fall? Huh? Do you try to fall? No. Which of you want to walk outside now and fall flat on your face? You want that? No. But can you guarantee you won't fall? No. no. So when you fall, what should I do? Laugh at you and say, you're so stupid, you fall. No. Is that a good thing to fall? No. No. But what are we supposed to do? Get up. Help you. Come on. Come on, let me help you. So that is Jesus Christ, our advocate. May not judge according to their action. The word says to us in First John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write that you sin not. And perchance you fall, don't worry. Jesus is there for you. You have an advocate with the Father. We are not talking here about presumptuous sin. Now I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We are going to verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, where are we going brethren? Verse 26.
because I want you to understand this concept. The word says, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remain it no more sacrifice for sin. So that moment when you're presuming upon God's grace, for where sin did abound, grace abound much more. There is no sacrifice for you. That moment, I don't know what Jesus is going to do tomorrow or later on. I'm not telling you that Jesus will never forgive you. But that moment when you are presumptuous in your sin, there is no sacrifice for you. Pray God you don't drop down and die that moment. Because you will be lost. So let us strive to walk in our uprightness and righteousness. Where are we headed? We are headed for that holy mountain. We are headed for that holy mountain. For the word says, what we are looking for in fact is that God will not pardon us while we are willfully sinning. Verse 17 says, and I know it is a strong saying, but look at what the word says in Galatians 2 and verse 17. The Bible says in plain language, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, therefore Christ is therefore Christ the minister of sin. That's mocking God. So the times in which we live are times close to when Jesus will stop his ministry and say, it is finished. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. We must extricate ourselves from sin through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling. I don't want that song, we fall down and we get up. No way. I don't want that experience. If I fall, so be it, I'll get up. But my plan is to walk with Jesus in uprightness. Amen. And that should be the desire of every heart here today. Amen. But no, but not just victory over sin, but will cry, Lord, fill me with your spirit that I may not take for granted your love, your mercy, and go outside of your will when I know what your will is for me. Because only when we strive by faith to have that experience will we say, Lord, and cling to the Lamb of God that he might keep us alive among the lost, above the lust of the flesh, rather. Above the lust of the eye. Above the pride of life. We will be able to say like the psalmist, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from this great transgression. It's uprightness, brothers. Last week, sermon, the preacher said, we should strive to be in a position where God is well pleased with us. Have you considered my servant, Wayne Sinclair? I'm well pleased in him. Have you considered my servant? Put your name there. I am well pleased. You know, the best thing could be said of me, brethren. The very best thing. Have you considered my servant Paul? He's an upright man that despises evil and feareth the Lord. We can't get better than that. Amen. It's the best thing. That is what we should strive for. Amen. Who's speaking? God! Who is talking about Job? Have you considered my servant Job? He's talking to the devil. Where are you coming from? Why are you in our meeting? I'm here to represent earth. Don't you know I have all of earth? It is now man. The Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? A man that despises you evil and feareth me. Satan scoffed. It's because you protect him. It's because you have a special circle of angels around you. But if you move them, I guarantee you, he will sin, he will mock you to your face. Brethren, we must be like Job. 
It's not impossible. It is not Job who did it. But Job surrendered to Christ. And through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, God could make him an upright man. Um, what I find interesting about Psalm 19 is that phrase, the great transgression, the phrase, the great transgression, it means revolt or rebellion. Then will I take place, uh, sorry, this rebellion that will take place on a grand scale. And they are going to force you and me to rebel. To stand up against God. A revolt or rebellion that takes place politically or in a religious forum. Our country, the United States of America, was built on religious foundation and religious principles. Are you with me? Um, but we are moving in a time when those who hold the reins of power are desperately trying to erase uh, the separation between church and the state. Did Jesus recognize us, church and state? Yes, he did. In uh, we are seeing the mark of the beast in the book of Psalms. David was a prophet. Go back with me to Psalms chapter 11 verse 2. We understand who are the upright here. There are people who are striving by faith to have an experience with God so they can stand in the awe when the union of church and state becomes a reality. A people who are trying to be a part of God's eternal kingdom who are striving by faith to be a part of God's sealing work. But we are told that the wicked are bending their bow upon their arrows to shoot at them in darkness, in secrecy. What, what, is, what are the arrows that they are planning to shoot at us? What are those arrows they are bending on their bow? Look with me to Jeremiah chapter 9. And I want you to see the reality of what's going on in secrecy. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 3. The word of the Lord says, And they bend their tongues like their bows of what? For lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil. And they know not me, saith the Lord. What are those arrows they are going to shoot at us, brethren? Lies. lies. Did they shoot the same lies at Jesus? Yes. yes. Did they shoot those same lies at the apostles? Yes. Lies. Bend their tongues for lies. They are preparing lies. John chapter 8 verse 1 for the book, the Bible clearly identifies. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. He speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and he is the father of it. So their kingdom of lies is being generated and pushed by the devil. What are they doing? They are preparing to destroy the foundation of God's commandments. They are preparing to destroy the foundation of this very country. What's the foundation of this country? This country was founded upon two main principles. Republicanism, and protestantism. What does this mean? Republicanism uh, gives us the the and, and protestantism gives us freedom of speech and freedom of religion. If you want to worship a cow in the United States of America, enjoy yourself. 
the law gives you that right. If you want to go on the internet and say bad things about the president, you may, because we have freedom of speech. I'm not telling you to do it. It's not a good thing to do. The Lord says we should love even our very enemies. Let no uncomely speech proceed out of your mouth. But the law gives you that right. And not so long ago, there were three attempts made. And I'm going to share these with you. There were three attempts made to change what is called the Johnson Amendment. This is an amendment that Lyndon Johnson put in place to prevent churches which have a large congregation of people and money from influencing the political process, the separation of church and state, keep them separate. But now, the church people have recognized they have power. And if we can use this power, we can take over the government of the United States of America. We just need to get rid of that thing called the Johnson's Amendment. And the politicians have recognized that if they could only remove it, they would have all these congregations mega churches, one church, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, plus their influence. It would be the most powerful political action uh, committee in the United States of America. Do they have a reason to want to move the Johnson Amendment so that they can take over politics? Yes. When we let the politicians loose, what do we get? What did we get out of Barack Obama? The blessing of homosexuality. Now, in Canada, they have gone mad with this thing. They're teaching the children. So why don't we take away our politics? They don't know what to, do, what to do with it. They're destroying us Christians. So you know what? Let's take it from them. And we will make the laws. But do you know what they are going to do when they get that power? They are going to annul the sub. Because now they will have the political clout to do it. And that is why the scriptures say, when they change the foundations. What will the righteous do? They are calling out to the righteous and mocking the righteous. We are told in Revelation chapter 12 verse 17, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keeps the commandment of God and have the testimonies of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 17, we see this beast coming out of the earth which we have tracked in prophecy to the United States of America. And this beast will speak as a dragon, a beast is a kingdom. Yes. Yes. This kingdom is going to speak as a dragon. The dragon doesn't like God's commandments. And he is determined to destroy them. But it was on those very same principles that this country was established. Do you know what is below the mercy seat in the most holy place of the sanctuary? The Ten Commandments. It's the foundation of God's government. Where can you find ten laws that are so comprehensive, so beautiful, that if we should keep them, we would have utter peace in our land? But the devil doesn't like them. So this country is going to make war on those government commandments. Um, what will be the lie, brothers and sisters? 
What does Jeremiah 9 and verse 8 says? Look closely. Their tongue is as an arrow shot out, it speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he laid in wait. So they are going to tell us, don't worry. Don't worry about these things. We see it every day. Those who are leading this, this, this march against God's commandments and against the Sabbath, what do they say to, to people like us? We are fanatics. We cry wolf, wolf when nothing is happening. Uh, we speak badly of other people. We, 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 we say things about them that is not true. We don't love other Christians because we are saying our prophecy says they are going to do us harm. Nobody is troubling you Adventists from worshipping on Saturday. It has never been and it will never be. But that is not what we are told in scripture. They speak lies. Their tongue is, an, is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. And that is what is called an ambush. When you are settled down and expecting peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. Amen. Yes. Remember back when the Twin Towers fell? So we have to take away some of your liberty in order to protect. They took the liberties. Did we get protection? Mm -hmm. And they continued to strip away our liberties. Television came out with cameras that were watching people and we didn't even know about it. <laughs> they are gathering your cell phone information and tracking wherever you go. I went all over the place and I took pictures. And when I went to Walmart and printed those pictures, on those pictures were the very location. Jamaica, West Palm Beach, Miami, New York. With the very days I took those pictures. And little by little, we are losing our rights. And soon, they are going to strip us of everything. So we know that behind the scenes, they are doing their baleful work. And as soon as they are able to take away these restrictions that is imposed upon them by the Johnson Amendment, I want you to recognize that the Sunday law will be steering us right in the face. Yes. It is not because these politicians are of a religious mind and they want to protect us so badly that they didn't succeed at the three chances already in the first year of Donald Trump to move this Johnson Amendment. It is because God is giving you and I some more time to climb up into those mountains and preach the gospel. Go knocking around Florida, they won't listen to you. But you know what, Sister Yoli? You told me that those people up in that mountain were ecstatic. They want to hear the message. And when Sister Yvonne went up to her mountain, her daughter came back rejoicing. She'll Amen. tell you about it herself. Amen. But God still has people out there in the highways and byways Amen. who are waiting for us to bring the message of salvation to them. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preaching all the world for a witness. Without forcing anybody to accept it. But go search the scriptures yourself. You will see that it is true. And if you can't find it, come sit down with me. I will take time and I will go through it with you. Yes. I have no reason to lie. I have no reason to deceive. I just want us to recognize that time is over. Yes. Yes. Soon Jesus is going to say it is finished. There is no more time prophecy. Scripture doesn't extend far into the future. We are living in the time when everything the apostles have said taking place. The 
so on the move, it is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether, whether where this undercurrent is tending. The word of the Lord says in Council of the Churches, page 335, its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. That's the spirit of the devil. The one who hates Jesus and wants to destroy everything he has made. He's, he's defacing man with tattoos, homosexuality, and lesbianism, and bestiality. One man is sweet, married to his main dog. He's defacing us, he's laughing, he's mocking, he's making us. As Psalm chapter 48, verse 20 and verse 12 says, Man created in honor and know it not is as the beast that perish. How much more beast like can we get? The word of the Lord says, this uh, Review and Herald, December 11, 1888. They are working in blindness. They do not see uh, that if a protestant government sacrifices the principles they have made, uh, that has made them free, an independent nation, and through legislation bring into the constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusions, they are plunging into the Roman of the dark ages during the dark ages if you were caught with a bible it was reason to chop off your head it's the same darkness we are going back into those who are making an effort to change the constitution and secure a law enforcing Sunday observance little realize what will be the result but the problem is we ourselves are sleeping. The crisis is there in Congress. They're trying to change it. And we are fast asleep. We're going on as if, what are you worried about? My friends, the movement is going forward. When it speaks, we will hear the speech of the dragon. The Bible told us in the book of Psalm chapter 11, and verse 1, the Lord, in the Lord I put my trust. I will say to my soul, flee a bird, as a bird to your mountain. Verse 2 reminds us, for lo, the wicked bend their bows in ambush. They make ready their arrows, for upon the string they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. We read that these uh, arrows are lies. For lo, the wicked bend their bow in ambush. Look what the Bible says in verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? When they destroy the commandments, turn on your radios tomorrow morning, and you'll hear, the law is done away with, the law is done away with, the law is done away with. Everything attacking the law makes no sense, does it? The law is done away with, why, why, why do you lock me up if I commit murder? The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Ridiculous, eh? Thou shalt not steal. You walk into one of these churches, one of these preachers, with their mega churches who are preaching these lies. You take the church tithes and offering and you walk out the front door. You think they're going to smile at you. Well, you know, let them go. The law is done away with. Thou shalt not see hypocrisy. But go to the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No, 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 no. The law is done away with. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. If the law, if the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Won't we have a dilemma when the foundation principles of the United States of America are removed? When they take away freedom of speech and religious freedom, and they begin to legislate religion, won't we have a problem, brethren? Won't we have a problem, brethren? You won't have a problem? 
to be all right with you? No. The righteous, my brothers and sisters, are those who keep the commandments of God by faith and are seeking to walk in the power of the Lord in uprightness of Jesus. For the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. All of them. The Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, your commandment people, keeping people, what will they do as we begin to come to a close? It is clear that the destruction of the foundation comes as a result of these arrows that are shot at the upright by the wicked. But what are these arrows? They are lies. You know that the word foundation speaks right here of in Psalm chapter 11 verse 3. Literally means the basis for political and moral support. What is the very basis for political and uh, for politically and morally for us living as God commanded people, keep, keeping people? It is this constitution nowhere else. I saw them burning people in India. I saw them beating people in Africa. I saw them beating people in South America for religious freedom. But here in the United States, we have this blessing. Look at the response in verse 4, Psalm chapter 11 and verse 4. God speaks. He gives us an assurance. The word says the Lord is in his... Uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is where? Heaven. Is in heaven. <coughs> the ultimate foundation is in heaven. Where they won't be able to destroy the original. They may destroy a copy, but not the original. And one day he's going to pull out the original. And the world is going to see it. They are going to have a look. And they're going to see that what we were saying is true. The word here, habitations, mean foundation. At the foundation of the throne of God, there is righteousness and there is judgment. As we learn in Psalm 119, verse uh, 172. Just as when we go into the most holy place of the sanctuary, we saw the Ark of the Covenant. It is called the Ark of the Covenant because inside were the Ten Commandments. On the top of the Ark, we have the Mercy Seat, which was a symbol of God's throne. The foundation of God's throne, the very principles that govern God's eternal kingdom are His commandments, His righteousness. Brothers and sisters, when God responds by saying, the Lord is in his holy temple, for his throne is in the heavens. What he's saying is this. It makes no difference what men may do. Amen. Amen. And your destiny is predicated on what you do. Yeah. You can choose him and he will deliver you. Or you can crumble in fear to the pressure that the system will bring and be lost in darkness. It makes no difference what they do. All the nations of the world can make legislation that will seek to void my law. Because my law is sure and secure. It is at my throne, even at my eternal throne. The kingdoms will come to an end. Their kingdom shall come to an end, but mine shall stand forever. If you stand for righteousness, God in uprightness will wipe away these kingdoms with the winds of this earth, and you will inherit his holy mountain. The wicked shall receive their portion. And their portion is spoken of in Psalm chapter 11, verse 6. It is, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Where else in the Bible is this warned? Revelation chapter 14. If any man worship the beast and his image, the same shall drink of the wine of God's wrath which is soon to be poured out 
without mixture. You don't put the honey in the water before you make the tea. When we speak of tea, in our Jamaican parlance, we call anything hot with mint or chocolate or whatever you call it. There is a way to make the beverage. Am I right? Yes. You boil the water, you put the mint, then you put the sugar. True or not? Do you put the pot, pot on, put the mint in, pour the honey? No. That's how you, how you make it, right? No. So why don't you look in the world today? Don't you see the beverage is ready? Don't you see a world that is loaded with sin and ripe for God's judgment? Yes. You can't see it? You don't see it? You don't see evil? Evil, evil continuum. Yeah. If you look at that little child at the border crying because she's ripped out of the hands of her mother, and we have all these billionaires in Congress talking about we can't let them in because they're going to come and take over our country. When did God make waters? When did He make the United States of America and put a wall around? And how did we get in here in, in any case? <laughs> if you want to keep them out, you should leave too. Leave the Indians here. They are the ones who are here. But it speaks to all heartless and cruel we have become. And our general conference sit in quietude and say nothing. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Now is the time to make our calling and election sure. Because the foundations are getting ready to be destroyed. Brothers and sisters, we have seen from the word of God. And we have seen from recent events that the devil is moving in secrecy. But he's moving with diligence and a relentless spirit that will not be denied until he has secured his purpose. And he will secure it because prophecy told us he will. It doesn't mean we should sit down passively. Okay, prophecy said it's going to happen, so we should just accept it. We must fight. Because we need to extract every soul from his kingdom that we can. We need to break down the strongholds of evil and take out every nugget of gold that is in it for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We are soldiers of Christ. Stand like a brave. We sing these songs. Soldiers of Christ arise. Put your armor on. But even if that's in that same breath, God declares that when the dragon rises up in his warfare with God's remnant, there will be a people who will, uh, a people who have received the seal of the living God because they have made it their daily responsibility to surrender the wall of their hearts to the hand of God. In the hands of Jesus Christ, the righteous, because they are numbered among the upright, God is calling you to be in that gathering. Brethren, if today you want to say, Lord, I realize that we are closer to the conclusion of all things as we presently see it and we are closer than I understand ever before. I want us to take a stand today. I want us to take a stand today. I want us to pledge within our hearts that things won't be business as usual. That time is past. I don't care what your religious persuasion, whether you're Seventh-day Adventist or not. It's time to take a stand and walk with Jesus. Amen. The remnant is not a status quo set of people. 
the dragon is warring with them, Revelation 12, 17, but they still keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. So they are not scared. They are not frightened out of their decision. They are determined to walk with God. Amen. If you want to say, I need to be among the upright, that my children might have a living example of what it means to serve and love Jesus. I need to be amongst the upright that my co-workers and my neighbors might see the glory of God. That they too might escape from the corruption that is in the world. While this door on the ark of safety is open, if that is your desire, I want you to come forward. I want you to stand. If that is the desire of your heart. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. At the Lord portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for. to break us out of the stupor, the stupor that overtakes us, and make our lives just so ordinary. We want to take a new step with Jesus. It is time for us to ask of the Lord, reign in this time of the latter reign, that our lives will exhibit a difference. documented it in scripture a long time ago but John reminds us that these things were written for us and for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come and our oh Lord are the wicked not in secrecy you know sneaky dark way uh, shooting their arrows at the upright in heart and those who have a desire to walk in holiness and righteousness, those who have a desire to put away sin, Lord, we pray that you will grant unto us a new heart and renew a right spirit within us. We need to study the word. <clears throat> for your word reminds us that we shall seek you and find you when we search for you with all our hearts. Not in a flippant, not in a careless, not in a... Uh, easy going way but searching for the gospel as if for hid treasure yes. and when we search for it lord you promise that you will pour out these doctrines upon us as 
due and you will distill it upon us so that we can understand where we are and we can make the necessary changes that our lives may be in harmony with Jesus Christ our Savior. Yes, we thank you for these uh, opportunities and we pray Lord that you will lead and direct our every step. We have gathered before you today to worship before you. We pray Lord that you will search each heart and those who are saying, Lord, I want things to change. I want to, to, to minister to my family members. I want to be a living witness to my co-workers. I want to be a witness to the congregations and the synagogues in which I worship. I want people to see a difference in me. I want to understand what is trending and I want to be a part of those who are receiving the seal of the living God that one day I may be able to stand in his holy mountain. We are praying, Lord, that you will open these hearts and that you will pour within them your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us a spirit of prayer. Give us a spirit of thirst for righteousness. Yes. Give us a spirit of longing to be in harmony with you. Yes. Lord, we have wandered far from home for too long. Yes. We have been distracted by the glitz and the glitter of this world for, for too long. About the job and about the career and about things which do not tend for eternal reality. And we have not sought the purification of the soul. Yes. Many of us have been led astray by parents, by brothers. My sister, the silken cords of affection, husband and wife and children, many of us by ministers and leaders, some of them didn't know they were leading us astray. They may not have meant us harm, but the devil in his sneaky way have caused deception to spread. You warned us in St. Matthew 24, take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they shall deceive many. Lord, we don't want to be among those who are deceived. We don't want to serve sin anymore. We don't want to be slaves to sin anymore. We want to receive that born again, that new experience. As you said to Nicodemus, he must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, he must be born again. We want to be born again. We don't want to have to think and calculate <clears throat> we want to listen to the holy spirit when he says turn to the right hand or turn to the left that we do not sin against you so we pray lord that he will give us this spirit you're preparing this small set of people yes as a gideon to go and do a mighty work yes. as a david against the mighty goliath yes. for the work out there is mighty yes. but lord you have given us success we have tasted success in Haiti and in Jamaica before and elsewhere and we like it Lord it is sweet amen. we want more yes. Yes, amen. we want more Lord we want more of you yes, we want yes. to see people plucked from the, the, the torrents of sin yes. and stand and glorify our Father which is amen. in heaven amen. beg of you Lord wash us and purge us from the guilty stains thereof and help us to walk in newness and uprightness yes. before you. May the Holy Spirit be with us and abide us. Now unto him that is able to keep us from the fall and to present us faultless. Unto our Father be all glory, dominion, and power, both now and evermore. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And for his sake we ask it. Amen.